Have you ever stopped to uh, thank God for the no's, that's N-O, not K-N-O-W, that no in your life in which you have experienced? Uh, to thank God for the closed doors, uh, most of us probably have, and at least as I was reflecting back a little bit about it, it it's not one of those things that's on the forefront of, of uh, my response is, uh, Lord, thank you for saying no. Uh, most of the time, you know, we think through, well, I, I, I really think that was a good plan. I, I think that was a good idea. And yet, as we look back in life, we can realize that uh, there are some no's, some closed doors that God gives to us, prayers that we didn't get the answer yes, and maybe it was a wait, but there are some in which we have received the word no. And frankly, when we look back, we realize that our desire would have been a disaster. There are some times in our life where we wanted it, and yet as we look back, we see that God in his grace and his mercy, as he was leading us, we are grateful for the fact that he said no. Maybe for uh, some of you, it's a parent who said no, and you're kind of thinking, well, you know, I don't think that's right. I think, that, I think there's a really good way to pull this off. And yet there's a parent who said no to you, and maybe later on in life, you will say, well, thank you for doing that. I agree, most of us, when we were younger, when mom and dad said no, we weren't excited about that, and, and we found other ways to attempt to get a yes out of them. Maybe it was to go to the one that was a little more open to our uh, suggestions, you know, maybe it was dad or maybe it was mom. And yet, as we look back, we are, we are grateful for that. And we may have thought at the time that our parents were just the meanest. Maybe it's a breakup of a relationship. That in a dating relationship, you were hoping that this would work out and that, that you would go someplace. And you looked at that and you realized, looking back, you're so grateful that God broke that up. Maybe it's a job situation that you thought, if I could just get involved in this particular job, that uh, this would be the answer to all of the questions that I had, and this would really advance my, my status. And yet, as you look back, and God said no, and you look back and you say, man, I'm really grateful that God said no. As I was reflecting on this, even in my own life, one of the things that uh, I, was, uh, I kind of reflect on is, is after high school, I had this desire to get to fly an airplane. Uh, I liked, you know, planes would go over, and so I thought, well, I, I think that's what, that's, that's what I want to do, and I think, I, you know, I can use this uh, for God's kingdom, because when my parents were ambassadors for Christ in the Philippines, uh, we, Missionary Aviation was, uh, Missionary Aviation Fellowship was certainly well known. Wycliffe also had an uh, arm that was in aviation, and you could move around. I thought, you know, that, that's, that's what I think I, I want to do. And so I applied to a school that had a, a really great uh, aviation program, missionary aviation program. And I got back a response, no. And I thought, what in the world is this? You know, this, this is a plan. It's a good one. And, and God, you have, you know, this is a good plan for me. So then I went on to, we went, I went on to college and um, still had that kind of burning in the back of my mind and, and was trying to figure out what I wanted to do college-wise and those of you who've been to college, you know that um, you have your requirements the first couple of years, so you take all the basics, and then at least by your junior year, you ought to declare a major if you don't want to spend the rest of your life in college. And uh, so by the junior year, you know, you're being forced uh, because it's time to register, and it's time to purchase books, and it's time to, to do all that, and so I did, and I went to the bookstore and purchased uh, the books for a particular line of, uh, uh, of college, and and I got to thinking, you know, this is not really how I want to spend the rest of my life. So I hauled back all the books and changed my major and I went a different route. And yet I was still thinking about this aspect of flying. And so I began to think about, you know, military's got a pretty good plan. And, and there was a certain branch of military. It wasn't the Air Force because, you know, you could go all over the place. Um, and because I wanted to fly, and so I was thinking about this one, and, and I began to talk to the recruiter, and oh, we'll promise you this, and we'll promise you that, and those of you who've been in the military, you understand what's promised beforehand before you sign on the dotted line can surely change, and I began to become aware of that, and think, you know, I don't think this is really what God has for me, and so I went a different route, and, and yet as I look back, uh, at enrolling at Grace College, because I didn't get my first uh, plan, it was there that I met Pam from a little tiny town from eastern Pennsylvania. And 44 years later, we are still uh, in the journey together uh, through the ups and the downs and the good and the difficult times. And I know you look and you say, man, 44 years, we didn't think you were that old. I know it. 
I know, I get that. But nevertheless, as we look at that particular thing, we, we realize that there was a no because God wanted to do something else. This morning, we return to the story of David. And in this particular story, as God is preparing David to be king, God says no. He says no to David. If you remember a little bit, as we just go back a little bit in, our, in the story of David, David has made a disastrous decision uh, earlier because he was in a place of great disappointment and discouragement. And those are the dangerous times. That often in those times of great discouragement, we make decisions that impact us that we don't seek God's direction, and David didn't. And so he determined that he was going to figure this out all by himself. He was going to make it work by himself, and so he had this plan. And he ran from God, and he ends up in the enemy camp. David, a a man of God, a, a child of God, of the Jewish nation, is in the enemy camp of the Philistines because he has run from God. Hasn't sought God's direction. And we pick up the story. If if you want to grab a Bible, turn to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 28. There might be one in a pew in front of you, or in the, excuse me, in a chair. We don't have pews anymore. (laughs) Freudian slip. Uh, In the chair in front of you, somewhere around page 312, uh, Old Testament, if you want to follow along with us. And David, in this section, uh, we find that God says no to him, and in that no, God is rescuing David. He is rescuing David from a bad situation. He is rescuing David from himself. And so there's a story here for all of us as we look at life and as we consider God's leading in our own life, that what we have recorded for us are not just some sort of facts on a page. This has been very skillfully created and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit so that we might know how to live our lives. If we remember back in chapter 27 of 1 Samuel, David seeks salvation from Saul's hatred by running to the enemy, the Philistines. I just referenced that. In chapter 28, Saul seeks salvation from God by rejecting and turning to the occult medium. Saul has rejected God and he's seeking some way to hear from God in chapter 28. And as we looked at that, it's the tragedy of life without God where uh, King Saul had put God on the periphery, had pushed God out of his life, that God was no longer important in his life, that he was going to live his life God's way, even though he started off as one who had a relationship, at least externally, with God. And Saul has declined to such a point that that he's being pushed, pushed out. God is being pushed out. And in this chapter, we find that, uh, in chapter 29, we find that David is saved from the Philistines by God. So as we jump into the text, first of all, we're going to see in verses uh, 1 through 5, David's rejection. David's rejection by the Philistines that that God has uh, put within the Philistines, the enemies of God, uh, a rejection. And so we pick up the story in verse 1 of chapter 29. The Philistines were gathered together, all their armies at Aphek, while the Israelites were camping by the spring, which is in Jezreel. So the armies are now assembling. There's getting ready to be this gigantic battle that's going to take place. The five five Philistine kings have brought their army there. This is not just a little skirmish. This is not just a little probe into Israel. This is going to be a major battle that's being fought. And they've assembled at Aphek to uh, get all of the troops together, these five kings, so that they might determine what their strength is as they're getting ready to go against Israel, as they're getting ready to fight Israel. And as I mentioned to you, this has been a dangerous time in David's life. David has fled from God's place of blessing because he's fearful of Saul He's ended up in the Philistine camp and King Achish has given to, them, given to David a city called Ziklag and David has been there. He's been in that city for 16 months. And probably from his perspective, at least there's some form of peace. He was no longer fleeing from Saul, but he's in a place where he ought not to be. But even though he's there, it is peaceful. And that can be the danger in our lives when we push God to the periphery that we can get in a a place where we find it peaceful. It's not where God wants us. And we may have the tendency to say, well, see, 
it worked out. I don't have the problems I had previously. But even in this time in which David has fled from God, God has not fled from David. And there's quite a difference. We say, well, what's the difference between Saul and David? Why is it that Saul has been rejected by God? And yet David, even though he is living apart from God, God is still pursuing him. And the reason is God has rejected Saul because Saul has rejected God. But David still has this heart for God. God knows that deep down inside there is this relationship that is there that David, though he's questioning the promises of God, God had promised to David, I will set you on the throne. You will not be killed from Saul, by Saul. And even though David had come very close to uh, an interaction with Saul, God had always protected him. But David had questions and he had doubts about God's promises and so he made some decisions. He made the decision to join the enemy during that deep time of discouragement. And that's what sets us up for this particular story. And so then in verse 2, and the Lord, lords of the Philistines, five kings, and there were five cities uh, uh, there. And the lords of the Philistines were uh, proceeding by hundreds and by thousands. And David and his men were proceeding on the rear with a quiche. <laughs> They're going to review the troops. We have the army here. Let's see what our fighting power is. And as they're going through this review, there are the troops of the Philistines, but there in the very back is David and his soldiers. At least 600 trained fighting men. Look at the first part of verse 3. And the commanders of the Philistines said, what are the Hebrews doing here? It's a really good question. What are they doing here? David and his men are the enemy. He's been running from Saul. So what are they doing here? It's an important question. They're not on our side. Well, you look and see in the last part of verse 3 that Achish defends David. And he says, uh, Achish said to his commanders, Is this not David, the servant of Saul, the king of Israel, who has been with me these days? Remember, 16 months. And, and Achish makes David his body, the head of his bodyguard. Or rather, these years, and I have found no fault in him from the day he deserted, deserted whom? Saul, to me to this day. And so Achish, the enemy, defends David, this, this man of God. They're reviewing the troops. We'll look at the response of the Philistines beginning in verse 4. But the commanders of the Philistines were angry with him, with Achish. And the commanders of the Philistines said to him, Make the man go back, that he may return to his place where you have assigned him. And don't let him go down to battle with us, lest in the battle he become an adversary for us. For with what could this man make himself even acceptable to his lord, Saul? Would it not be that the heads of these men, these armies, those who are part of us, is this not David, of whom they sang and dances and songs? Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. The other four commanders were really concerned. Here's David at the, at the tail end of their army, which is a very strategic place. It's not the leftovers. Because if Israel would do a pincer movement where they would come around from behind and somehow be able to encircle, that's a strategic place to be able to defend. Those of you who maybe watched, uh, have seen the, the movie Gettysburg, you understand that there was that flanking movement that was being made and there, were, there was a, a general who saw the need and was able to stop it. And the rest of these men say, what better way for, for David to get back in the good graces of Saul than to start attacking us instead of them? What's he doing here? It's interesting, isn't it, that God uses the enemies of God to, create, to uh, discipline and correct his own servant. Isn't that fascinating? I wonder at times in our life if God hasn't used those who are not followers of Jesus to sometimes challenge us in areas where we need to be challenged. Now, sometimes it's just to provoke things. Well, I thought you were a Christian, you know. And, but at other times, it might have been a response that is 
not honoring to the Lord. And so they sat, man, I thought, I thought, I thought you were a Christian. What's this? And in humility, we need to stop and say, you know, you're absolutely right. And sometimes God can use those who are not followers of Jesus to correct us. I think that's what happens here. The leaders also make reference to the song. It's a song that created problems for David, if you remember. David has gone out, the early part of of 1 Samuel, David has gone out, he killed Goliath. You remember that story? He was probably a, a teenager, late teenager at that point in time, just trusted God to go deal with the Philistines. And then David began leading some of uh, the troops out in in skirmishes with the Philistines, and God gave him the ability to to win the battles. And you remember what turned, and, and, and Saul was grateful for what David had done because here was an individual that was fighting for Israel and was also fighting for King Saul, but... As they came back from one of the battles and, and, and the women and the kids get out to sing a song. And the first verse, you know, Saul loves it. Saul has killed his thousands. Saul has killed his thousands. And then he went to verse 2. And David has killed his ten thousands. <laughs> and jealousy rose up in the heart of Saul. And he tried literally to pin David to the wall in a number of different times. And it's that song that has followed David. Have you ever had a song that gets stuck in your head and you can't get rid of it? Somebody hums a tune and lo and behold, it's stuck. Oh, that's what happens with this song. But it's interesting, isn't it, that the Philistines, the enemies of God, have this song stuck in their heads. I don't know if You know, in in beginning uh, history, they would have studied about it, but they remember the fact that David was the one that they sang that he's killed his ten thousands. So David is rejected. And we see that in verses 6 to 11 where David returns back to Ziklag. He returns back what has been his home for the past 16 months. And so Achish tells David to go home, verse 6, and Achish called David and said to him, as the Lord lives, you've been upright and you're going out and you're coming in with me and the army are pleasing in my sight for I've not found evil in you from the day of your coming to me to this day. Nevertheless, you are not pleasing in the sight of the Lord's. Now remember, David had been very, very deceptive. He'd gone to this outer part. He was making raids, not on Israel, but he gave the impression to Achish that he was making raids on Israel, but he wasn't. And so Akish is looking at David and saying, no, you've been, you've been very honorable in what you've been doing, but David has not. David has been developing this aspect of deception. And it becomes more and more easy to do deception the longer we practice it. The longer we don't tell the truth, it becomes easier not to tell the truth the next time. And so here it is that uh, this aspect continues and And Achish says, you know, I find it fascinating. Look at verse 6. As the, what's the next word? Lord, okay? And you'll find in most of your translations, it's capital L, capital O, capital R, and capital D. That is the God of the Israelites. This is not God's. Achish is not saying, you know, as the gods live, this is as your God lives. Sometimes we look at that and wonder, how, how, do, we, how do we deal with that? When, when the enemy is praising David, when David has forgotten who he is. David's not a Philistine. He's an Israelite. But he's been immersed in that culture for so long, he's forgotten that, I think. And that can be a warning to us that we can get immersed in our culture so much that we forget that we're followers of Jesus. Because we're living in this bubble of culture. And then those who don't know Christ begin to praise us. Now, we are told in the New Testament that we as followers of Jesus are to live in such a way that we honor those around us and honor 
to live in such a way that we are at peace with everyone as long as it's possible with us. There are some things we can't be at peace with. We'll see that in a, in a few minutes. But it's so easy for us. Oh, you know, that, that's great. You know, that you, you did really well. Um, where priorities become the same as the world around us. David became comfortable in enemy territory. And we can become comfortable in enemy territory. If you remember um, the story of Lot, Abraham and Lot, and, and Lot goes and he's on the outskirts of Sodom and he's living there. And, and pretty soon he moves, we find him inside the city and he's living inside the city. He's in enemy territory. Now, the New Testament tells us, and it's, it's fascinating that it uses this terminology about Lot, that, that righteous Lot had his soul tormented every day. He found that, that he's living in a culture, and he couldn't be satisfied living in that culture because he really belonged to God, but he, he couldn't find himself really enjoying his relationship with God because he was living in a culture. You know, attempting to walk uh, with a foot in both worlds. It's an impossibility. It's the worst place to be. And David's become comfortable in enemy territory. And so we do see that uh, the Philistines aren't happy. So verse 7, now therefore, as Akish says to him, return, go in peace. So that you don't displease the Lord of the Philistines. I find that another fascinating, just a little short reference if, you mark, if you're marking your Bibles, that might be an interesting one to mark. David wasn't too concerned about displeasing the Philistines before he got into enemy territory, was he? I can assure you when he laid Goliath low with his stone and cut off Goliath's head, that the Philistines were displeased. When David went to battle, and won by God's grace and strength, the Philistines were displeased. And now they've come to a place where Akish says to him, you know, if you start living a little different, you're going to be displeasing to the Philistines. Again, our purpose as followers of Jesus aren't, isn't to go around and be bad representations and provoke all kinds of things, but we're not on the same page. We're not following the same king. We belong to a different kingdom. And those kingdoms are going to clash. And at times, we're going to have to stand up and, and speak for the kingdom of God. And, and David, at this point, finds himself unable to do that. Verses 8 to 10, I'm still trying to figure out what David's doing here. You look at verse 8, and David said to Achish, but what have I done, and what have, I found in your, what have you found in your servant this day when I came before you to this day that I may not go out and fight against the enemies of my Lord? You know, what, what's wrong? Why can't I go with you? I, I think there, there are one or two responses. Maybe you can come up with a third or a fourth, and that's fine. I'm, I'm willing to learn. But I think one of them is the fact that David is faking the fact that he doesn't have to go. I've heard it told. You know, maybe, maybe you were being asked by family, you're, you know, your family was getting ready to go do something, you know, go, go shopping. And you had something come up in your schedule that just conflicted. And they say to you, no, I'm just really sorry, you know, it, it conflicts, you won't be able to go. Oh, I was so looking forward to this. I was hoping I could spend the next three hours with you in a grocery store. Or you as, uh, and, and I know some of you enjoy Lowe's and those places, but you would say, you know, oh, I'm so sorry I can't go with you to Lowe's. As you meander through the, the walkways looking for different items. So it's possible that David is doing a deception kind of thing here. That's possible. The second is that he perhaps planned to attack from the rear. That it's possible that he had planned to turn on Achish. But if he would have done that, he would have lost all credibility. 
I mean, David's getting ready to be king, but if you can't trust a king because he has broken promises, you don't want to make treaties with him. You've broken promises before. Why should I trust you? But the Philistines are adamant that uh, David's not going with them. And so, verse 9, Achish answered and said to David, I know that you are pleasing in my sight like an, like an angel of God. Nevertheless, the commanders of the Philistines have said, He must not go up with us. So, verse 10, Now then, arise early in the morning with the servants of your Lord, your soldiers, who have come with you. And as soon as you have arisen early in the morning and, and have light, get out of here. As soon as you can leave, leave. And so then in verse 11, so David arose early and his men to depart in the morning to return to the land of the Philistines. That's Ziklag. Remember, that city is in the land of the Philistines. And the Philistines went up to Jezreel. They're getting ready to fight. We'll see in a, in a couple of weeks. We're going to pause next week uh, as we reflect on Thanksgiving. Um, we'll come back to the story. This is a little bit of a spoiler alert if you go into uh, chapter 30. And that is that David has thought that everything is fine. He's been able to cover himself for the last 16 months. That things are going well. It's not Israel where he wanted to be, but, but it's okay. And when he gets back to Ziklag, he will find that his families have been kidnapped. The city has been burned. And he's lost his possessions. Dear friends, that's the ultimate result of living with the enemy. That it may go well for a while. It may look like we have it figured out. It might not be exactly where we want to be, but you know, it's okay. And what is God doing here? God is saying no to David, that God has not given up on David, that even though David had compromised himself, God cares enough about David and his men to move David to where he needs to be. And it's through a disaster. But that's for another couple weeks. So there are four lessons that that I'm reminded about uh, from this. Number one is the disaster of attempting to live a double life. Probably every single one of us in this room have been found ourselves to be tempted to, love a, to live a double life. We want the benefits of being a follower of Jesus, but maybe we want the financial security of the relationships of the world around us or to be accepted by them. We want a safe career. We want the friends that really aren't followers of Jesus and, and they have a tendency to move us to where we ought not to go. Jesus, if you remember in Revelation chapter 3, is going around the churches which represent us. And he comes to the church of Laodicea and he says, you know, I wish you were either hot or cold. I wish you were really living for me or not living for me. And you say, well, why does he wish he were cold? Because when we are cold, we understand that we need to come back and we need to walk in a relationship with Jesus. But when we're lukewarm as the Laodicean church, we're kind of a foot in both worlds and we think we've got it figured out, but it's the most dangerous place to be for a follower of Jesus. So disaster is about to strike. Jesus said this, if you... If you're of the world, the world would love you. But if, if, if you're a follower of me, you're going to find yourself at odds with the world. You're going to displease the world. Again, we don't go around poking it to see what kind of a rise we can get out of it. But we realize that we, are, we're, we belong to a different kingdom. We belong to a different Lord. We belong to Jesus. Second lesson, the gift of God's no. Sometimes God's no is to move us out of our compromise. I think that's what's going on here. And maybe as uh, we look at our lives, it would, be a great, it would be a great family discussion around the lunch table or dinner table. You know, what have you seen God say no? Maybe it, was, maybe it was to move you out of a place of mediocrity. Because we've had too much of the world to have peace with God and we've got too much... Too much of God to really have any peace with the world. It's a dangerous place to be. Thirdly, the challenge of living for God in the world, but not of it. 
We are called to live in this world. Jesus said that. Father, I pray. This is John 17. Father, I pray. I'm getting ready to come back to you, and I pray for these who are in the world. That Jesus was looking down the hallways and the corridors of time. He's praying for you and me. That as we live in this world, there are, there are two den, uh, dangers that, that we face. Number one, danger is to become like the world. But there's another danger, and that's to get isolated from the world to form our own little religious communes. Jesus left us here for a reason. He left us here to advance his kingdom. And if we isolate into our own little groups, how is the world going to hear about Christ? Rod Dreher, a few years ago, came out with what he called the Benedict Option. And what he was saying was that Christians ought to pull out of everything that's secular, go find their, uh, create their own little religious communes and, and kind of live there. Well, I think, didn't Jesus say something about being salt and light into our world? How are people going to hear that, there's, that Jesus went to the cross to pay for our sins and our failures, that he loves us so much that he died in our place and he offers to us eternal life that begins here and now in a relationship with him and goes on forever. How are they going to find that out if we withdraw? Somebody told us that we don't get to heaven based upon our own good efforts and based upon our own good works, based upon some religion. In fact, religion will keep you from heaven. It isn't based on the efforts that we've made. It's what Jesus has done. And all of us stand at the foot of the cross on level playing field. There's nothing that's too bad that the blood of Jesus Christ can't cover. For God so loved the world. He loved you. And he loved me that Jesus went to the cross. And so we don't withdraw. And then lastly, even in our wandering no follower of Jesus is beyond redemption. Isn't that great? God never says, all right, I'm tired with you. You know, you've, you've, Dan, you've done the same thing like 30 times, 50 times. So I'm, I'm, I'm done with you. It's never that. Even as David's out of the will of God, really for his life, God calls him back. And the same thing is true for us. As a follower of Jesus, we can trust God's leading in our life, even when he says no. As a follower of Jesus, we can trust God's leading in our life, even when he says no. And maybe even when we can't exactly say, thanks, I needed that. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you and your grace and mercy do lead us, that you don't give up on us when we put our faith and trust in Christ. You've gone on record, you've promised that you're going to see us safely home. Jesus himself said in John 10 as the good shepherd, I haven't lost anyone. The only one who's been lost was Judas, who was never one of the flock. And Father, this is a challenge to us that as, as we live our lives for you, you care enough about us to get involved. Do you know the numbers of the hairs on our head? You know when a, a sparrow falls and you know us. And so, Lord, as, as we seek to live our lives, there are times which we need to say, thank you for the no. I'm going to trust you. I don't understand it. Just as our earthly parents told us at times no, and we most of the time didn't understand it then. Sometimes it's because we're heading in a direction we ought not to go. Sometimes it's because you have something else for us. It isn't always because we're off the rails. So, Lord, we're grateful that when we become your children, we become followers of Jesus, place our faith and trust for eternal life, which begins here and now, goes on forever, that we're one of your children and you seek what's best for us as we walk with you. And even the no's that we get, we can say, thank you, Father. Don't understand it, but thank you that you care enough. And so we are truly grateful that you know us intimately and intricately and you offer to us hope in this world and also for the one to come through Christ. And so it's in his name we pray.